Hey there everyone, what's up? Uh, back today with more impressions video and this one I'm gonna warn you already is gonna be long because um, like the last game uh, that I played that I was really looking forward to, I took notes when I played so uh, this one is not gonna be nearly as long as the, uh, the SMT4 uh, review impressions video I guess. Uh, it couldn't possibly be that long, I don't have as many notes but it will be probably pretty long so you could probably tell that by looking at the length of the video but anyway we today we're gonna be talking about the Persona Q this is Persona Q Shadow of the Labyrinth uh, the newest game in the Persona series it's not a main game obviously but it is on the 3DS it is a Persona game and apparently it is canon but it, I guess it doesn't really matter for the story anyway but we'll get into it so Persona Q, Persona Q, uh, I've been waiting for this game to come out for a while and you know when it came out I had it pre-ordered and stinging Amazon Japan was like shady with their pre-ordering like they had this pre-order thing where there's like an Amazon you know like an Amazon bonus pre-order but the bonus bonus I'm I say loosely because the bonus cost uh, about 10 extra dollars and it was like a, literally a downloadable like uh wallpaper that's ten dollars for that and what happened was amazon like gave priority to people who ordered that one so like they were shipping that one and then not shipping to people who didn't order the ten dollar extra one with the downloadable wallpaper and so my order went out late like two or three days late or something and uh it was supposed to at least until I, I called them. I didn't call. I didn't call them. I sent an angry email, and they sent it out that day. Actually, after I mailed them, but it was shady because like they, you know, they uh, extended the date for no reason. And uh, I think they looked at that and said, "Uh, yeah, I guess that is kind of dirty. So we'll just send it out today." And they did. They actually sent it out. So regardless, that's like totally unrelated to this game but the game itself I got the game came with um, a CD that I don't see within arm's reach so I guess I'm not gonna show it to you but it does come with a track like I think there's only four tracks on it. it's not like a huge CD soundtrack or anything but it did come with you know with the game here I'm sorry I'm like all disheveled I just came home from work and I'm just like kinda you know sitting on the floor here so it's not like I'm doing anything but anyway persona q we'll get into it i took a lot of notes and this will probably be a little disjointed because the notes i was just writing them while i you know while i was playing so i tried to kind of edit them up to be like in small groups but it's not it's not actually uh gonna happen but anyway we'll get into just the basics of it so first if you've played persona three or four and you go into this game expecting that, you're going to be really disappointed because it's not even remotely similar in terms of gameplay or, you know, how it looks or how it, you know, how things happen in the game. Pretty much all of that is different. There's no social links in this game. Um, there's no other characters besides the Persona 3 and Persona 4 cast of characters. So there's no, like social links to build there's no um you know it's not even it's it's first person for for example that's like a it's a first person dungeon crawler it's not a third person dungeon crawler like the other persona games except for one um so i guess it's more like persona one than persona three and four except it's not really it's almost exactly like etrian odyssey um with a few kind of different things with the battle system it's essentially Etrian Odyssey with a Persona skin. There's no... Uh, it, they don't even really try to hide it. Um, almost all the systems in the game are like Etrian Odyssey. Um, the only things that are like Persona is Personas. <laughs> Personas and uh, s the battle system slightly. I'll talk about that later, though. We're just talking about the basics right now. So uh, the art style is really different from the other. I mean, you can't really see it, but I'm sure you, if you're in watching this video, you're probably interested in the game and probably have seen what it looks like already. It is a lot more like the kind of Etrian Odyssey chibi 
cutesy, lowly kind of look that that I don't like for Etrian Odyssey. And this game, it it is kind of like a cutesy reimagining of the Persona characters, but it, it's not horrible, actually. It, it does kind of keep the same tone as the other designs of the characters, and the, and the characters are, you know, some of them, like Teddy, for example, he's Kuma in Japanese, so I'm gonna try to use the English names if I can, like, but Teddy doesn't look all that different at all, and some of the characters look, you know, pretty similar to what they normally would look like, so it's not horrible. Um, it's not as good as, like, the regular Persona art style, but what can you do, really? I guess that's what they went with on this, more like Etrian Odyssey. And what else? Uh, again, a lot like Etrian Odyssey, when you go through the dungeons, you have to draw your own maps. So, you know, this on the bottom of the screen of the DS, you're drawing the maps as you go along. Um, if you like that in Etrian Odyssey, you'll like it in Persona Q. Uh, Persona Q did something with the map drawing that I don't remember being in Etrian Odyssey 4, but it actually kind of shows you temporarily where walls are when you're on the map. So, like, when you look around, it'll show it on the map, and then it'll disappear if you move too far away. But uh, that was really helpful for drawing the maps. It made it really quick. Um, I remember playing the Etrian Odyssey... Etrian Odyssey 3, at least... Uh, <laughs> But uh, probably 4, too. Yeah, I didn't play Millennium Girl because I've already played Etrian Odyssey 1. But um, in that, in I'm pretty sure in 4 it didn't show the where, where the walls were were when you were making the maps. So it it was it's a little slower. But in this one, it by showing the just by showing the walls temporarily on the map, it speeds up the drawing a lot. I mean, it it made things really quick. So that was a I hope they continue that in the Etrian Odyssey games, actually, because it's a really nice thing that makes things go faster. But, uh, again, like I said, it's a first-person dungeon crawler, and the battles are first-person as well. So if you, if you don't like that, uh, if you're, you're more used to how Persona works, you're not going to be uh, very happy with this. But if you're used to Etrian Odyssey, you'll be, you know, right on board, because that's exactly how it is. Um... But we'll, we'll talk about the battle for a second. The battle rules are not the same as uh, Persona. For example, you do have all-out attacks, and you you, too, you do get like a kind of bonus for hitting a weakness or hitting a, a critical hit, like Persona. But unlike Persona, if you knock down all the enemies in one round, you don't get an all-out attack for free. Um, if you if you if all the characters score a critical hit you'll probably get an all out attack but sometimes if three characters hit a hit us all hit a, a critical or a weakness you'll get an all out attack it's kind of it seems to be like on a gradient by like a percentage so like if you get 3 you probably have like a 50% chance or something i'm just guessing at that and it kind of goes up from there until 5 is like 100% i think but uh you know i've had times where all, four people will get the uh a critical hit and be like lit up and they won't do an all-out attack so it's not it's not definite but i think on five it's definite but it's hard to get five you know it's in, in normally in persona you're dealing with three people in your party but um you have uh what else did i want to say about the the battle sometimes the characters will hop out when they do attack so it's not like you can't see them at all uh, they usually will... It's it's a lot like, actually, um, Lost Heroes, which I think nobody besides me was really excited about, but that game had a similar kind of battle system, actually, where the characters will jump out and do moves when you, when you use them, and sometimes they'll, like, do special moves that, you know, focus on them. Um, I think besides that, though, the... Um, there is something that's different from Betrian Odyssey and Persona in that, like, when you give your characters Personas, they have, like, a secondary health and SP, well, your, like, kind of um, magic points or whatever, spirit points, or I don't remember what the SP stands for. Um, but HP and SP has, like, a secondary bar that will automatically refill when the battle's over. So it actually kind of makes things a little bit easier than an Etrian Odyssey game. And 
you know, you but you do have to spend, you know, you'll spend hit points or SP depending on what kind of attacks you're using. So, you know, going into a battle, you'll be able to use like one or two attacks depending on which personas you have, obviously, but um, and what attacks you're doing. But you'll probably be able to use one or two without really like losing any health realistically because it'll be that kind of secondary bar that it, that gets depleted first. So I guess that it's helpful. It's just it does make like you can kind of auto heal through the entire game. You don't, you know, there's not really ever a point where I was like stopping to heal my characters after a battle, even if they were really low, because a lot of times that kind of second bar was enough. So it does kind of make things a bit easier. Um, speaking of that, I played the game. I, I played through the game twice. So I played through with each character, each of the main characters. I started with Persona Three character main character and then they moved to persona 4 in the second playthrough and you know what happens is you do have a ton of characters to choose from and obviously you're not going to be using them all so you know you kind of have to build a party in the beginning and stick with it almost almost stick with it you there's like from the first dungeon you um depending on which main character you selected you can only select characters for the first dungeon from persona 3 or persona 4 you can't mix and match after the first dungeon you'll get more so that's helpful i mean it's it's cool if you like persona 3 you select persona 3 you'll get to use those characters right away and you'll find that like when the persona 4 characters come in you, you know they actually come in at the same level mainly as your your party is so so it doesn't it's not hard to start mixing and matching them but after that once you start building them up it's harder and harder to get people caught up to you so you kind of have to pick a party right off from the beginning and maybe you can switch out one or two people every once in a while but for the most part you're going to be sticking with the same kind of people throughout at least in my experience that's kind of what i did um so yeah that, that's kind of your basics of the game but there are other things going on. So let's talk about the dungeons. The dungeons, there's... Um, I'm try I don't want to spoil anything, but it's not really a spoiler because the story is so pointed that you, you, you couldn't possibly mistake it. But there are five total dungeons, even though like the game wants you to believe there's four. Um, you have five dungeons, and they all have their various themes. I don't, I don't know if I should give away the themes. They're not like... It's not super important or anything, but, uh, you know, maybe you want to be surprised. But, um, you know, for example, you know, the first the first dungeon has, like, a kind of Alice in Wonderland theme. And the rest of the, the, rest of the themes for the dungeons are some, usually something related to um, the Persona 4 story. Um, that's probably the best I can say, except for the last dungeon, which is directly related to this story. But it's, like I said, it's so obvious. The last dungeon, when it's the last dungeon, is so obvious, and what, it, what it's going to be is, is, like, obvious right from the beginning of the game. So you have almost no... It, this is... I couldn't even say this was a spoiler. Um, let's see. I've been trying to not give anything away even like so i'm kind of skipping over some of these notes because they might be spoiler ish um there are a few new there are two new characters in this game i forgot to mention um ray and zen who are the two like the ray is the girl eating the hot dog all the time the uh, corn dog and zen is the guy that's with her um, they're not Persona users, so they can't use Personas, but they have some other attacks. And there's a reason for them having those attacks that you don't really understand until the near the end. So I won't give it away, but there is a reason why they have magic and can fight without Personas. But, yeah. So th that's the only new characters, though. Um, the Velvet Room is staffed by, you know, Theodore and Elizabeth and, um, Margaret depending on which route. I guess, like, uh, let's see. From those three, you have Theodore runs, like, the kind of shop. So he he will, when you defeat enemies, you you collect stuff from the enemies. 
stuff. It's stuff. It's just like parts of enemies and uh, shadow pieces and things that the shadows were carrying or whatever. And you give them all to Theodore and he'll um, make weapons and armor from them. Like, again, Etrian Odyssey. Not like Persona. Um, and then Elizabeth runs a kind of like a hospital, essentially. Um, she does all your healing. And she gives you your kind of side story missions. And then, of course, Margaret runs the the uh, Velvet Room. And a, a thing to point out here is that Igor is not in the game. There's no Igor at all. And I'm wondering what they're going to do with it, actually. Not, be, not because, like, you know, he's not in this game, so he's he's gone, but the voice actor died, so it's the kind of thing where I, I wonder if he'll be in Persona 5. That's, <laughs> I wonder if they'll just get a new voice actor, or they'll just like come up with some reason why he's not there. Um, but they didn't even really come up with a reason why he wasn't there in this. They just kind of pointed out, oh yeah, he's not here this time, and then never mentioned it again. Um, and he never showed up. But, yeah. So, back to the dungeons um the dungeons are really really nice actually uh they all look really good so there's a lot of detail in the walls like there's lots of things going on it's busy there's not it's not cheaply done well I'm, it might be but they've done it really well <laughs> they've they've spent a lot of uh time and effort to make the uh dungeons varied even within themselves so you know, like I said, the first dungeon is Alice in Wonderland dungeon, but, you know, the tiles aren't, like, a bunch of repeating tiles over and over again. It's not like two or three. There's, like, ten or fifteen that kind of are all over the place. So it seems like a lot of variation, even though, like, obviously the some are repeated. But, you know, it does give you a nice kind of detailed and kind of bright and colorful look to it, which is really nice, actually. really liked all of the dungeons in this game. They're all done really well. Um, and you'll find things like the, the dungeon tiles are animated in some places, so some places you'll see, like, trails and handprints and things show up and disappear on the, on the, on the walls and on the floor, or you'll see things moving in, in things. It's really dynamic and done well, uh, much better than a lot of, um, you know, kind of cheaper made or less skillfully made third per first person dungeon crawlers. So, let's see. Um, yeah. I think also what I wanted to say about the dungeons were that they're varied. So, like, like I, the first dungeon I'm saying is bright and colorful. It's kind of wild. And you, as you go on, the, there's more colorful dungeons, but there's also dark dungeons that are kind of horror-based or kind of night-themed. And you have different palettes and they're all like really different from each other they're all really different looking and they're all really nice looking so the dungeons are top notch they're really thumbs up for those they're pretty spectacular looking and they're all done really well um so yeah another thing i wanted to mention was the foes which you might not know if you've never played um etrian odyssey but in etrian odyssey there's things called foes which are strong monsters that you can see uh everything else in the game is a is a random random battles so but you can't see the monsters they're not on the screen but foes are on the screen you can avoid them because usually they're in entry odyssey for example if you go into the first dungeon and you're trying to fight an foe you're probably just going to get wiped immediately they probably one shot everybody in your party so they're really strong um but Persona Q isn't quite as punishing as that, and I actually found that, for the most part, I could beat the FOEs, even the first dungeon when you're going through. You it, The battles are long. They're really long, longer than the boss battles. and But they're not difficult. They're just long. So you're, you're not doing a lot of damage, but you're, uh, you can fight them, and they don't kill you in one shot like they would in Etrian Odyssey. So you can actually beat the FOEs for the most part. Until some points in the game, you kind of stop being able to. But for for vast majority of the game, the FOEs are 
you know, tough battles and they're kind of long, so you don't want to do them, but they're not impossible and they're not like an instant death if you fight them, which I don't know how I feel because in Etrian Odyssey, there, there is a real sense of like, you have to avoid the FOEs for a while at least until you're a little bit stronger than that, than the, than the rest of the level, or you, you're just going to get killed. And it, I think in this game, it kind of takes away from that. So a lot of the times, for example, the FOEs aren't just used to be like strong fights kind of wandering around. They're used as puzzles and things. Like you have to lure some FOEs out of their position to another position so you can get past and you can see how that could be complicated if there's multiple. And what happens is sometimes when, you, you know, if if it seems like it's going to be an annoying puzzle or something, you can just kill them straight off. Just like, whatever, I'm not doing this puzzle. I'll just kill the FOE, and then you can just continue on, which kind of defeats the purpose of them. And Etrian Odyssey also does stuff like that, but like I said, the FOEs were much more difficult and much more threatening. So, you know, it's it was probably done better there. Uh, that's not to say that they're all bad. Um, the FOEs, are, like I said, are long battles. So, like, a lot of times it's even for if you're thinking, like, well, I don't want to do this puzzle with these FOEs. Like, a lot of times it'll take longer to fight the FOE than it would to just do the puzzle. So, it's not... Almost always it's, it's better to just do the puzzle. It's just, you know, if you kill the FOE, you'll be able to collect their items and possibly make stronger weapons for yourself, which will, you know again help you out in the long run so that was I, I i wasn't really excited about that though i i was hoping that it would be they would be more horrifyingly tough and they weren't um so eventually later on like i said later on in the game they get to a point where it is too they're kind of too hard to beat when at the level you're at so and it's done almost, I want to say it's almost done artificially in the sense that uh, they'll just like put a time limit on the battle. So what will happen is like, you know, you'll be going good. Like, oh, I can beat this guy. It's just going to take a while, like all of them. And then you'll like see after every 10 turns, the uh, the FOE will full heal. And then you'll be like, oh, well, now I have to run away because there's no way I can do enough damage in 10 turns. So that's that's what I mean by kind of artificial difficulty for those. They're not really difficult in the sense that if they didn't auto heal every ten turns, you would you would essentially be able to crush them. And that was like one of my complaints about it. It didn't feel like a, a really like strong enemy enemy kind of difficulty, I guess. Uh, and that I, I guess I can talk about that now in the sense that the whole difficulty for the game is not incredibly hard. And I played, like I said, did I say? I don't know, whatever. I played the first playthrough on normal, which is just like the middle difficulty, which usually I play everything when I start on normal, just because, like, I assume that's, like, the kind of base level that the developer wants you to play the game at. So I just played it normal, and I found that, like, this game was too easy on normal. Um, there are five levels of difficulty, so I can kind of see that. But if you think, like, you're, if you're, like, relatively good at, first-person dungeon crawlers, or if you've, like, played through an Etrian Odyssey game and you think, like, yeah, it's challenging, but it's not, like, super challenging, and you played on normal, obviously, if you played on easy on Etrian Odyssey, you're probably going to want to play on easy on this, too, but if you play through Etrian Odyssey on normal or not not casual or whatever, um, you'll probably be fine putting this on hard right from the beginning. Um, it wouldn't be a bad thing for you. To do that I think I kind of wish I'd done that for my first playthrough but you know it's not a, it's not even locked in at at uh, that unless you're playing on risky but you know I didn't bring it up I didn't bring up the difficulty from normal because I started on normal and it feels like kind of weird to halfway through change the difficulty even though it was a little on the easy side so what I did was on the second playthrough I played through on hard and I thought the difficulty was a bit better that way. It felt better that way, at least, even though 
you know, I could have see I could see how it would be more challenging in the sense that it would be more like an Etrian Odyssey Odyssey game on the hard setting than it would be on the normal setting. I hope that makes sense. I don't I don't really know, but it, the difficulty overall for this game on normal is not very hard, I think. For the most for the most part you can just kind of blow through everything. And if like I said, you can fight the FOEs in the stage. And if you can beat the FOE in the stage, you can beat the boss because usually the boss is not as difficult as the FOEs. They usually just have a gimmick. So, you know, there's that. Um, let's see. What else should I talk about? So, like I said, when you drop... Enemies drop things and you can get, you know, armor and weapons from them. But there's also locations around the stages, around the, the dungeons, where you can just find items. They're like power spots. Um, this was also in Etrian Odyssey. There was three types in Etrian Odyssey um, 4, but uh, in Persona Q there's only one type and you have like the option to to harvest from them, but uh, the way they do with different types is that like the power spot will kind of power up or whatever and it'll give you the option to when in the powered up state, if you search, you have the chance of finding a rare item or you have a chance of an enemy appearing. And, you know, when you're doing that, you're either, you'll either get a cool item or you'll get attacked. And you tend to get attacked more than you get a cool item, but, you know, it's worth a shot. So there's that. So you can collect those items. And by collecting those, of course, you can get better armor and weapons, which is, like, the main, the main reason to be collecting anything in this game. Um... Let's see. There are side stories also. So there's um, a bunch of side stories in the game. Um, some involve other characters. And, you know, some of them are just kind of fetch quests. So just go into the dungeon and find this item. Or go in the dungeon and beat this enemy. Or go in the dungeon and find this persona and show it to Elizabeth or something. There's a bunch of those. But there's also different ones that are kind of story related so you'll go in and you'll like find something that happened in the dungeon like you know the characters are talking back and forth and they'll find something and they'll be like oh well i'll put in a request for this so you know you'll have a request like junpei has to study or something and you know you'll have to go back out of the dungeon and you'll have to like answer a quiz with junpei so that you can or i mean it also, it'll be uh, Ken also has that same quest if you're depending on which, you know, uh, character you're using, I guess, which main character. So there's stuff like that. There's a, a, a bunch of different quests. So some of them will, of course, give you more items. Some will give you um, kind of materials and some will give you persona depending on the quest. So they're all useful to do and most of them are not so difficult. And some of them you can kind of clear in advance. You'll find the location before you get the quest. So you can just kind of mark it on the map and just go back there once you find the quest. So that's pretty easy. It's pretty clear when the, when you find those because it'll tell you, like pretty much say, you should mark this map part on the map. Um, and you'll do that and you'll get a quest later. But uh, yeah, the quests actually are pretty interesting in... There's some good ones, and you're usually the end quests were really good. So after you beat the game, there are extra quests for the main character. But if you beat the game with both main characters, you get even more extra quests. There's special quests, and there's some quests that only unlock after you beat the game and after you've cleared a bunch of special quests or extra extra quests. They're called. I don't know what they'll be called in the English version. But if you clear all of those, they're part of a kind of continuous story. You'll get an extra, extra one after you beat the game. Um, and like I said, after you beat the game with both main characters, you get an extra special hard battle against all three of the uh, Velvet Room characters. So you'll have to fight at the same time Elizabeth, Margaret, and Theodore, which is... That's the hardest, game. That's the hardest battle in the game. Uh, easily the hardest battle in the game. Um... Yeah, that's that. I'll just say that. I won't give anything away. Uh, let's see. There are a bunch of demons in this game. So when you're, like, collecting personas, if you're 
really into getting like a complete persona list like the full compendium uh, there's a good amount except they're not hard to get and I wasn't even trying to complete the persona compendium and I didn't complete it but I got to about 90% without trying so if that's you know and the only reason I didn't get the rest of them was because I didn't max out my character levels so like I said I beat the game twice and the first time I beat it I was about level 70 and the second time I was about level 60 so you know that's uh, there's a bunch you can't unlock until you're level 99 or I think 99 maybe there I'm not sure what the uh, final persona level is in the in the compendium at least but it's not there were a bunch more after I was level 70 so yeah let's see what else the personas actually is pretty cool you can you know, of course there's a velvet room so you can sacrifice personas to you know you can fuse them you can sacrifice them for various things so i'll explain that you can um the way the fusion works is it's not selectable it is kind of but not really like when you fuse personas you'll have some slots that are available where you can select from a certain set number of skills um for example if you have two personas together and you're making a new one the, nut, the skills the new persona can inherit are limited by the type of persona it is. So some personas are kind of support personas, so like they'll only be able to inherit persona skills that are support based. Even if like both of the personas you're fusing together have a ton of strong attack skills, the new one, if it's a support persona, won't be able to inherit any of those. It won't even be an option. Uh, they won't come up. So that was kind of frustrating because some of the time you'll have like these cool persona skills that you want, but there's like almost no way to inherit them into something else that's more useful. Which which brings me to the other ways you can get persona skills. Um, which is some personas, oh all personas actually, but depending on skill, can be sacrificed and turned into a tarot card. And those, it, the tarot card is a skill card, and the skill card is a skill that the characters use, not personas, but the characters will use them to permanently have that skill as usable for the character. So regardless of the persona they're using, they'll be able to use this skill you got from the skill card. So it is actually kind of useful in the sense that you can, if you have a lot of money and it's not hard to get money, you can you can just summon the persona with the skills you want so everybody can have recarm, everybody can have uh, Samrikarm, everybody can have Mediraha. <laughs> now, like, I don't even know if, I, if any of those were, uh, are the English names. Um, but think like the, the, uh, full recovery spells, like from death, from, and from KO, I guess, yeah, or like full life recovery. Everybody can have those, or everybody can have like boost skills or auto, like, kind of auto auto heal spells or whatever depending on if you have enough money and enough skill cards you can pretty much you know make your party any way you like um so that was pretty helpful or you can take two persona skill cards if you have extra ones you'll eventually you'll just have too many all the time and you can sacrifice them to give experience to your you know personas you're using so they can get more skills quicker um, that's in, towards the end of the game. You're not going to be want to. You're not going to want to be grinding any anything. So you'll just kind of be like, well, I can get easy experience for my personas by going back and fighting old, F, like weak FOEs, and just getting skill cards and you know dumping the experience on your existing personas. It's like a lot faster than grinding. And I mean. For the record, I didn't grind at all in this. I didn't. There was no grinding that went on in this. I just went through the st stages like normal. I did 100% um, draw all the maps for all the stages. So, in you know, obviously you'll fight a bit doing that because you have to step on every square. But I didn't grind. I didn't particularly go into the dungeon just to fight. Every time I was in there, I was just clearing of the maps 100%, going to the next floor and rinse, repeat. 
it's kind of all I did. I didn't, there's no need to grind. It's not difficult enough to grind. <laughs> there's no need. And a lot of the times, it doesn't even really matter. Um, the level is not all that important. It's just kind of what your personas have that's important. And if you make a good team with good skills, you know, their level is not all that important except for health and SP. And even that can be kind of managed depending on the personas they have. So, you know, I don't think you'd be doing yourself a favor by spending a ton of time grinding because it's almost unnecessary. So, yeah. Uh, let's see. There's a lot of events that happen in the game. So if people are wondering, like, you know, like I said in the beginning, there are no social links, but there are a lot of kind of skits and things that happen in the, with the story. So you'll be able to talk. All the characters interact a lot. There's a lot of things that happen in the dungeons, outside of the dungeons. There's a kind of meeting place where everybody gets together and you can kind of talk to, uh, you know, you, you'll be able to select from a list of kind of skits where people are talking about something that's happening or their opinion about this or just some goofy thing that's going on or maybe some worry they have. And you'll be able to talk to them and you'll have selections and stuff, but it doesn't really do anything, I don't think. Um, but you will get a bunch of story and kind of background information about characters and, you know, goofy interactions between Persona 3 and Persona 4 characters as well. So stuff that you haven't seen before. Which, a lot of the interactions are a very kind of fan service -y. It's just kind of, you know, what if, you know, Yukari was talking to, you know, uh, y y Yosuke or something. You're just kind of like, oh, okay, this is how they would interact. It's a lot of stuff like that. It's, all, it's not really like uh, crazy um, story building or anything. So, you know, it's not something you get like crazy excited about but it is fun so if you enjoy the characters from persona 3 or persona 4 or both you'll enjoy these because they're fun and you get more of the same characters all the characters are you know their same goofy selves and they all have their own little idiosyncrasies that make them interesting and you know playing off each other is fun it's it's a lot of fun basically it's not like a mind-bending story or even a really super in-depth story but it's a fun kind of... There's a lot of fun character interactions, so... And also, the character interactions are different depending on who you selected as your main character. So you'll go through the game and you'll find that, like, some events don't even happen when you're playing as, like... When I played through my first time in the, with the Persona 3 characters, I had different events happen or different characters come out at different times and say similar types of things. But, you know, when I played as the Persona 4 character, I had different events happen and different kind of wackiness happen. Uh, so, I think that, that gives it a bit of replay value, which is nice. Even though it's a long game. So, like I said, it's long. I think I spent about 110 hours total in, my, in two playthroughs. But um, the first playthrough was about 90 hours. So, <laughs> the second one was really quick because all the maps were already drawn. So you can just run right through the stages, which is why I was lower level when I started. But if even and if if you I'll give you a pro tip here: if you played through the first time and you love had both both uh, protagonists from the games Persona Three and Four in your party through the for the whole game, uh, you've just like given yourself a huge step up in the. Uh, second game. I didn't do that, so I, <laughs> you know, I, I was w much lower level than I had to be. But it, it was it was actually better that way, because I got to play the game on hard, which was, you know, more challenging at a lower level. But, uh, yeah, I think that's most of what I wanted to say. Um, I didn't talk about the music. The music is... Persona, <laughs> yeah, I mean, if you know the music for Persona 3 or Persona 4, it's pretty similar in both cases. There's kind of remi remix tracks from some of the older games, plus new tracks that are in the same style. If you didn't like the music from Persona 4, you're not going to like the music for this game. If you didn't like the music for Persona 3, you're probably not going to like the music in this game. Um, if you did like that those soundtracks, though, you'll like the soundtrack. And 
another cool point about the soundtrack actually was that um, the the battle music is different depending on the character you select. So if you play through as the Persona Three character, you, the, I think the battle music is better for the Persona Three than the Persona Four antagonist. But it's essentially the same song done two different ways. So it's pretty cool. It's a pretty nice touch, at least. Um, I'm pretty sure um, Shoji Meguro is a person who did the music. I guess Yuzo Koshiro did um, some of the music because he's thanked in the credits in the music section. So he must have done something for the music. I don't know what, but something from Etrian Odyssey, probably. Um, beyond that, that's about it. Um, that's all my notes, at least. Um, I think that's pretty much all I want to say, though. This video is already 40 minutes, um, and I did play through it twice, so I had a lot to say. Um, but if you think I missed something, or you have any extra questions, or whatever you want to hear about this, just ask below. Uh, I'm sure I'm forgetting stuff, even though I took notes. But, yeah, that was Persona Q. Overall, it's pretty good. If you like Etrian Odyssey, you'll like this game. If you like First Person Dungeon Crawlers, you'll like it. Um, I recommend starting on hard, though. Uh, for me, it would have been much better, I think. Um, I guess I'll probably play through it again at some point on Risky, just to uh, you know, see how that goes. But it should be fine. I don't think I'll have any trouble with it. Except maybe the uh, final battle after the uh, you know, after you beat the game. Oh, that was another one. The final point I wanted to bring up was that the uh, the boss, the bosses for this game are are like not challenging, <laughs> not like challenging um, in a way that you would expect. And they might have been challenging if had I not been fighting all the FOEs in the stage. But like once you fight them and you beat the FOEs, you're just kind of like, oh well, the end boss isn't going to even be this hard. So, and usually they're not. Even the end boss in the game were like, um, you know, I fought it and I was thinking like, well, this is way too easy. This couldn't possibly be the end boss. And it wasn't, so that was nice. But, you know, even then, like, the new end boss was like, not so hard either. So it was kind of like, oh, well, you know, it wasn't, you know, because like, actually, when the, when the end end boss came out, I was like, oh, now it's going to get real. And it didn't really. So it was, you know, there were, there were like almost no bosses I <laughs> that took more than one one try. So I think this game actually, when I think about it in the end, I think it is a lot more uh, casual focused. Not to say that it's a casual game; it's not obviously, but uh, it is like a little bit easier. It's on the easier side, even easier than Edge of Odyssey Four. So, you know, it's probably helpful because I'm sure a lot of people who have played Persona will get this game despite not having played, you know, first-person dungeon crawler before. I'm sure they'll find it difficult um, because they're not probably not used to the way they work. But if you're, like, someone who plays first-person dungeon crawlers, you're not going to find this game difficult. That's pretty much all I wanted to say, I think. So, again, any questions... Post them below. I'll answer best I can. So, yeah. That's about it. So, there was another extra long impressions video. This one is about 45 minutes. So, there you go. 45 minutes of Persona Q. Uh, I probably won't have a part two for this. Unlike the SMT one. So, yeah. I will catch you guys soon with some other stuff. More impressions videos. Maybe a pickup video or two. Who knows? Anyway, see you guys next time.